Part 5, Chapter 6 The Committed Escaper When Georgi Pavlovich Tenno talks nowadays about past escapees, his own, those of comrades, and those of which he knows only by repute, his words of praise for the most uncompromising and persistent heroes, Ivan Vorobyov, Mikhail Kaderov, Grigory Kudla, half his, half his of, are these. There was a committed escaper. A committed escaper. One who never for a minute doubts that a man cannot live behind bars. Not even as the most comfortable of trustees, in the accounts office, in the culture and education section, or in charge of the bread ration. One who, once he lands in prison, spends every waking hour thinking about escape and dreams of escape at night. One who has vowed never to resign himself, and subordinates every action to his need to escape. One for whom a day in prison can never just be another day. There are only days of preparation for escape. Days on the run, and days in the punishment cells after recapture and a beating. A committed escaper. This means one who knows what he is undertaking. One who has seen the bullet-riddled bodies of other escapers on the display along the central tract. He has also seen those brought back alive, like the man who was taken from hut to hut, black and blue and coughing blood, and made to shout, Prisoners, look what happened to me. It can happen to you, too. He knows that a runaway's body is usually too heavy to be delivered to camp, and that therefore the head alone is brought back in a duffel bag. Sometimes, this is more reliable proof according to the rule book, together with the right arm chopped off at the elbow so that the special section can check the fingerprints and write the man off. A committed escaper. It is for his benefit that the window bars are set in cement, that the camp area is encircled with dozens of strands of barbed wire, towers, fences, reinforced barriers, that ambushes and booby traps are set, that red meat is fed to gray dogs. The committed escaper is also one who refuses to be undermined by the reproaches of the average prisoner. You escapers make it worse for the rest. Discipline will be stiffer. Ten inspections a day. Thinner gruel. He ignores the whispered suggestions of other prisoners, not only those who urge resignation. Life's not so bad even in a camp, especially if you get parcels. But those who want him to join in protests or hunger strikes, because all that is not struggle but self-deception. Of all possible means of struggle, he has eyes only for one, believes only in one, devotes himself only to one. Escape. He cannot do otherwise. That is how he is made. A bird cannot renounce seasonal migration, and a committed escaper cannot help running away. In the intervals between unsuccessful attempts, peaceful prisoners would ask Tano, Why can't you just sit still? Why do you keep running? What do you expect to find on the outside, especially now? Tano was amazed. What do you mean, what do I expect to find? Freedom, of course. A whole day in the taiga without chains, that's what I call freedom. That was Tenno for you. In each new camp, he was transferred frequently, he was depressed and miserable until his next escape plan matured. Once he had a plan, Tenno was radiant, and a smile of triumph never left his lips. There is no room in this book for his complicated life story, but the urge to escape had been with him from birth. As a small boy, he had run away from boarding school in Bryansk to America, down the Desna in a rowboat. He had climbed the iron gates of the Piatigorsk orphanage in his underwear in midwinter and run away to his grandmother. He was a very unusual amalgam of sailor and circus performer. He had gone through a school for seamen, served before the mast on an icebreaker, as a boatswain on a trawler, as navigation officer in the Merchant Navy. He had graduated from the Army's Institute of Foreign Languages, spent the war with the Northern Fleet, sailed to Iceland and England as liaison officer with British convoys. But he had also, from his childhood on, practiced acrobatics. He had appeared in circuses. He had trained gymnasts on the beam, 
performed as a memory man, memorizing masses of words and figures, and as a mind reader. The circus and living in seaports had led to some slight contact with the criminal world. He had picked up something of their language, their adventurousness, their quick-wittedness, their daredeviltry. Later on, serving time with thieves in the numerous disciplinary barracks, he had absorbed more and more from them. This, too, would come in handy for the committed escaper. A man is the product of his whole experience. That is how we come to be what we are. In 1948, he was suddenly demobilized. This was a signal from the other world. He knew languages, had sailed on an English vessel, and was, moreover, an Estonian, though it is true, a Petersburg Estonian. But if we are to live, we must hope against hope. On Christmas Eve that year in Riga, where Christmas still feels like Christmas, like a holiday, he was arrested and taken to a cellar on the Amatu Street, next door to the conservatory. As he entered his first cell, he couldn't resist the temptation to tell the apathetically silent warder, My wife and I had tickets for the Count of Monte Cristo and should be watching it right now. He fought for freedom, and I shall never accept defeat. But it was too early yet to start fighting. We are always at the mercy of our assumption that a mistake has been made. Prison? For what? It's impossible. They'll soon get it sorted out. Indeed, before his transfer to Moscow, they deliberately reassured him. This is done as a safety measure when prisoners are in transit. Colonel Morshinin, chief of counter-espionage, even came to the station to see him off and shook hands with him. Have a good journey. There were four of them, Tenno and his special escort, and they traveled in a separate first-class compartment. The rhythm of the carriage wheels was soothing. We can fill their rattle with any meaning, any prophecy we please. It filled Tenno with hope that they would get it sorted out. And so he had no serious intention of running away. He was only sizing up the best way to do it. Later on, he would often remember that night and cluck with annoyance. Never again would it be so easy to run. Never again would freedom be so near. The luxury of a special escort came to an end at the station in Moscow. The admission routine, sleepless nights, solitary confinement, more solitary confinement, a naive request to be called for interrogation soon. The warder yawned. Don't be in such a hurry. You'll get more than you want shortly. At last, the interrogator. Right, tell me about your criminal activities. I'm absolutely innocent. Only Pope Pius is absolutely innocent. In his cell, he was tete -a -tete with a stool pigeon, trying to box him in. Come on, tell me what really happened. A few interrogations, and it was all quite clear. They'd never straighten it out, never let him go. So he must escape. The world fame of the Lefortevo prison did not taunt Tenno. Perhaps he was like a soldier new to the front who had experienced nothing and therefore fears nothing. It was the interrogator, Anatoly Levshin, who inspired Tenno's escape plan by a turning mean and arousing his hatred. People and peoples have different criteria. So many millions had endured beatings within those walls, without even calling it torture. But for Tenno, the realization that he could be beaten with impunity was intolerable. It was an outrage, and he would sooner die than suffer it. So when Levshin, after verbal threats, first advanced on him and raised his fist, Tenno jumped up and answered with trembling fury, "'Look, my life's worth nothing anyway!' but I can gouge one or both of your eyes out right now. That much I can do. The interrogator retreated. One rotten prisoner's life in exchange for a good eye was not much of a bargain. Next he tried to wear Tenno down in the punishment cells to sap his strength. Then he put on a show, pretending the woman screaming with pain in the next office was Tenno's wife, and that if he did not confess, she would undergo still worse tortures. Again, he had misjudged his man. If a blow from a fist was hard for Tenno to bear, the idea that his wife was being interrogated was no less so. It became increasingly obvious to the prisoner that the interrogator must be killed. This and his escape were combined in a single plan. 
Major Levshin, too, wore naval uniform, was tall and fair-haired. As far as the sentry on the interrogation block was concerned, Tenno could very easily pass for Levshin. True, Levshin's face was round and sleek, whereas Tenno had grown thin. In the meantime, they had removed the useless stoolie from the cell. His bed was left there, and Tenno examined it. A metal crosspiece was rusted through at the point where it was fixed to one of the legs. It was about seventy centimeters long. How could he break it off? First, he must perfect his skill in counting seconds precisely, then calculate for each warder the interval between two peeps through the spy hole. During one such interval, he tried his strength, and the metal bar cracked off at the rusted end. Breaking the other solid end was harder. He would have to stand on it with both feet, but then it would crash onto the floor. So in the interval between two visits, he must take time to put a pillow on the cement floor, stand on the bed frame, break it, replace the pillow, and hide the bar for the time being, say, in his bed. And all the time he must be counting seconds. It broke. The trick was done. But the problem was only half solved. If they came in and found it, he would be rotting in the punishment cells. Twenty days of that, and he would lose the strength he needed to escape, or even to defend himself against the interrogator. Yes, that was it. He would tear the mattress with his fingernails, extract a little of the flock, wrap flock around the ends of the bar, and put it back where it had been. Counting the seconds, right, it was there. But this was still good only for a short time. Once every ten days you went to the bathhouse, and while you were away, your cell was searched. They might discover the breakage, so he must act quickly. How was he to take the bar from the cell to the interrogation room? When they let you out of the cell block, there was no search. They only slapped your clothing when you came back from interrogation, and then only your sides and chest, where there were pockets. They were looking for a blade to prevent suicide. Under his naval jacket, Tenno wore the traditional sailor's striped jersey. It warms the body and soul alike. The sailor leaves his troubles ashore. He asked a warder for a needle. They will give you one at certain fixed times, as if to sew on buttons made of bread. He undid his jacket, undid his trousers, pulled out the edge of his jersey, and turned it up and stitched it so that it formed a little pocket for the lower end of the rod. He had previously snapped off a bit of tape from his underpants. Now he pretended to be sewing a button on his jacket and stitched this tape to the inside of his jersey at chest level, so that it formed a loop to hold the rod steady. Next, he put the jersey on back to front, and began practicing day after day. The rod was set in position down his back and under his jersey. It was pushed through the loop at the top until it rested in the pocket down below. The upper end of the rod came up to his neck, under his tunic collar. His training routine went like this. In the short time between two inspections, he would have to fling his hand to the back of his neck, seize the end of the rod while bending his trunk backward, then with a reverse movement straighten like a released bowstring while simultaneously drawing the rod, and strike the investigating officer a smart blow on the head. Then he would put everything back in place. He also provided himself with two wads of flock from the same mattress. These he could insert between his gums and his cheeks to make his face fuller. He must also, of course, be clean-shaven on the day, and they scraped you with blunt razors only once a week, so that the day must be chosen carefully. How was he to put some color into his cheeks? He would rub just a little blood on them. That fellow's blood. Mustn't forget anything important, and must pack it all into four or five minutes. When he's lying there knocked out, I must. 1. Slip off my jacket and put on his newer one with shoulder tabs. 2. Remove his shoelaces and lace my own floppy shoes up. That will take time. 3. Tuck his razor blade into a specially prepared place in the heel of my shoe. If they catch me and sling me into the nearest cell, I can cut my veins. 4. Examine all his documents and take what I need. 5. Memorize the license plate number and find the ignition key. 6. 
shove my own dossier into his bulky briefcase and take it with me. 7. Remove his watch. 8. Redden my cheeks with blood. 9. Drag his body behind the desk or screen so that anybody coming in will think he's left and not raise a hue and cry. 10. Roll the flock into little balls and put them in my cheeks. 11. Put on his coat and cap. 12. Disconnect the wires to the light switch. If anybody comes soon afterward, finds it dark and tries the switch, he will be sure to think the bulb has burnt out and that's why the interrogator has gone to another office. Even if they screw another bulb in, they won't immediately realize what has happened. That makes twelve things to be done, and the escape itself will be number thirteen. Of course, the odds were against him. For the moment, he gave himself a three to five percent chance of success. The outer guard room was completely unknown and had no real hope of getting past it, but he couldn't die here like a slave. So Tenno turned up, freshly shaven, for one nocturnal interrogation, with the iron bar behind his back. The interrogator questioned, abused, threatened, and all the time Tenno looked at him in surprise. Couldn't he sense that his hours were numbered? Tenno's heart thumped. A day of rejoicing was at hand, or perhaps his last day. Things turned out quite differently. Around midnight, another interrogator hurried into the room and began whispering into Levshin's ear. This had never happened before. Levshin made hurried preparations to leave, pressed the button for the warder to come and remove the prisoner. That was that. Tenno went back to his cell and replaced the iron bar. Then came a daytime interrogation, and it took a strange turn. The interrogator refrained from yelling, and weakened his resolve by predicting that he would get five to seven years, so that there was no need to be downhearted. Somehow Tenno no longer felt angry enough to split his head open. Tenno's wrath was not the sort that lasted. The mood of excitement had passed. It seemed to him now that the odds were too great, that it was too much of a gamble. The escaper's moods are perhaps even more capricious than those of the artist. All his lengthy preparations had gone for nothing. But the escaper must be ready for this, too. He had brandished his bar in the air a hundred times, killed a hundred interrogators. A dozen times he had lived through every minute of his escape in detail. In the office, past the square window, along to the guard room, beyond the guard room. He had worn himself out with an escape which he would not, after all, be making. Soon afterward, they changed his interrogator and transferred him to the Libyanka. There, Tenno did not actively prepare to escape. His heart was not in it now that his interrogation seemed to have taken a more hopeful turn. Vague hopes of clemency and reasonableness clouded Tenno's resolution. Only in the Buterki prison was he relieved of this burden. His sentence, read out from a piece of paper with a special board stamp, was confinement in camps for twenty-five years. He signed his name and felt relieved, found himself smiling, felt his legs carrying him easily to the cell for twenty-five-year prisoners. That sentence released him from humiliation, from the temptation to compromise, from humble submission, from truckling, from promises of five to seven years bestowed like alms on a beggar. Twenty-five, is it, you bastards? Right, if that's all we can expect from you, we escape. Other people in the cell might talk about what they liked, but Tenno wanted stories about escape attempts and those who took part in them. From the Kubishev transit prison, they were taking prisoners to the station in open trucks, making up a long train of red prison cars. In the transit prison, Tenno obtained from a local sneak thief who respected escapers two local addresses to which he might go for initial support. He shared these addresses with two other would-be runaways, and they concerted a plan. All three would try to sit in the back row, and when the truck slowed down at a turning, they would jump. All three of them at once, right, left, and rear, past the guards, knocking them over if necessary. The guards would open fire, but they would not hit all three. They might not shoot at all. There would be people in the streets. Would they give chase? No, they couldn't abandon the other prisoners in the truck. 
so they would just shout and fire into the air. If the runaways were stopped, it would be by ordinary people, our Soviet people, passers-by. To frighten them off, the runaways must pretend to be holding knives. They had no knives. The three of them maneuvered at the search point and hung back so that they would get onto the last truck and not leave before dusk. The last truck arrived, but it was not a shallow three-tonner like its predecessors, but a Studebaker with high sides. When he sat down, even Tenno found that the top of his head was below the rim. The Studebaker moved quickly. Here was the turn. Tenno looked around at his comrades in arms. There was terror on their faces. No, they wouldn't jump. No, they were not committed escapers. But can you be sure of yourself, he wondered. In the dark, with lanterns to light their way, to a confused accompaniment of barking, yelling, cursing, clanking, they were installed in cattle cars. Here Tenno let himself down. He was too slow to inspect the outside of the car. And your committed escaper must see everything while the scene is good. He is not allowed to miss anything at all. At stops, the guards anxiously sounded the cars with mallets. They sounded every single plank. They were afraid of something then, but of what? Afraid that a plank might be sawn through. So that was the thing to do. A small piece broken off a hacksaw and sharpened was produced by the thieves. They decided to cut through a solid plank under the bottom bed shelf. Then, when the train slowed down, to lower themselves through the gap, drop onto the line, and lie still until the cars had passed over them. True, the experts said that at the end of a cattle train carrying prisoners there was usually a drag, a metal scraper, with teeth which passed close to the ties, caught the body of anyone trying to escape, and dragged them over the ties to his death. All night long they took turns slipping under the bed shelf, sawing away at a plank in the wall, gripping the blade, which was only a few centimeters long, with a piece of a rag. It was hard going. Nonetheless, the first breach was made. The plank began to give a little. Loosening it, they saw in what was now in the morning light white unplaned boards outside their car. Why white? The reason was that an additional footboard for guards had been built onto their car. Right there, by the breach they had made, stood a sentry. It was impossible to go on sawing till the board came away. Prison escapes, like all forms of human activity, have their own history and their own theory. It's as well to know about them before you try your own hand. The history is that of previous escapes. You can learn the history from others who once escaped and were recaptured. Their experience has been dearly bought, with blood, with suffering, almost at the cost of their lives but to inquire in detail, step by step, about the attempts of one escaper, then a third, then a fifth, is no laughing matter. It can be very dangerous. It is not much less dangerous than asking whether anyone knows whom you should see about joining an underground organization. Still, as he moved from prison to prison, camp to camp, Tenno eagerly interrogated escapers. He carried out escapes himself. He was caught. He was caught. He had other escapers for cellmates in the camp jails, and this was his chance to question them. As for the theory of escape, it is very simple. You do it any way you can. If you can get away, that shows you know your theory. If you're caught, you haven't yet mastered it. The elementary principles are as follows. You can escape from a work site, or you can escape from the living area. It is easier from work sites. There are many of them. The security measures are less rigid, and the escaper has tools to hand. You can run alone. It is more difficult, but no one will betray you. Or you can run away in a group, which is easier, but then everything depends on whether you are a well-matched team. Theory further prescribes that you should know the geography as well as if you had an illuminated map in front of you, but you will never catch sight of a map in the camp. A further precept you must know the people through whose region your escape route lies. Then there is the following general advice as to method. You must constantly prepare to escape according to plan, but be ready at any minute to do it quite differently, to seize a chance. Tenno's first camp was Novorudnoy, near Jezkazgan. 
Now you are in the very place where they have doomed you to die. This is the place of all places from which you must escape. All around there is desert, salt flats and dunes, or firmer ground held together by tufted grass or prickly camel weed. In some parts of the plains, Kazakhs roam with their herds. In others, there is not a soul. There are no rivers, and you are very unlikely to come upon a well. The best time for flight is April or May, while melting snow still lingers here and there in puddles. But the camp guards are very well aware of this. At this time of year, the search of prisoners going out to work becomes stricter, and they are not allowed to take with them a single bite or a single rag more than necessary. During his time there, Tano had got to know a lot of people in the camp, and he now quickly assembled a team of four. Misha Kerderov, he had been with the Marines in North Korea, had crossed the 38th parallel to avoid a court-martial. Not wishing to spoil the good relations firmly established in Korea, the Americans had handed him back and he had got a quarter. Jadzik, a Polish driver from the Anders Army, he vividly summarized his life story with the help of his unmatching boots, one from Hitler, one from Stalin. And lastly, Sergi, a railway man from Kubyshev. Then a lorry arrived with real posts and rolls of barbed wire for a boundary fence, just as the dinner break was beginning. Tano's team, loving forced labor as they did, especially when it was to make their prison more secure, volunteered to unload the lorry in the rest period. They scrambled on to the back, but since it was, after all, dinner time, they took their time while they thought things over. The driver had moved away from his vehicle. The prisoners were lying all over the place, basking in the sun. Should they run for it or not? They had nothing ready. No knife, no equipment, no food, no plan. But Tenno knew from his little map that if they were driving, they must make a dash for Jezidi and then to Uluto. The lads were eager to try it. This was their chance, their lucky chance. From where they were to the sentry at the gate, the way was downhill. Just beyond the gate, the road rounded a hill. If they drove out fast, they'd soon be safe from marksmen, and the sentries could not leave their posts. They finished unloading before the break was over. Jazdick was to drive. He jumped off and puttered around the lorry while the other three lazily lay down in the rear, out of sight, hoping that some of the sentries hadn't seen where they had got to. Jazdick brought the driver over. We haven't kept you waiting, so let's have a smoke. They lit up. Right, wind her up. The driver got into the cab, but the engine obstinately refused to start. The three in the back of the lorry didn't know Jazdick's plan and thought their attempt had misfired. Jazdick began turning the crank. Still, the engine would not start. Jazdick was tired and he suggested to the driver that they change places. Now, Jazdick was in the cab and the engine immediately let out a roar. The lorry rolled down the slope toward the sentry at the gate. Jazdick told them later that he had tampered with the throttle while the driver was at the wheel, and quickly turned it on again before he himself took over. The driver was in no hurry to jump in. He thought that Jazdick would stop the lorry. Instead, it passed through the gate at speed. Two shouts of HALT! The lorry went on. Sentries opened fire, shooting into the air at first, because it looked very much like a mistake. Perhaps some shots were aimed at the lorry. The runaways couldn't tell. They were lying flat. Around a bend. Once behind the hill, they were safe from bullets. The three in the back kept their heads down. It was bumpy. They were traveling fast. Then suddenly, they came to a stop and Jazdick cried out in despair. He had taken the wrong turn and they were pulled up short by the gates of a mine with its own camp area and its watchtowers. More shooting. Guards ran toward them. The escapers tumbled out onto the ground, face downward, and covered their heads with their hands. Convoy guards kick, aiming particularly at the head, the ears, the temples, and, from above, at the spine. The wholesome universal rule, don't kick a man when he's down, did not apply in Stalin's Katorga. If a man was down, that's just what they did. Kicked him and if he was on his feet, they shot him. But the inquiry revealed that there had been no breakout. Yes, the lads said in unison that they had been dozing in the back when the lorry started moving, and then there was shooting and it was too late for them to jump off in case they were shot, and Jazdick, he was inexperienced, couldn't handle the lorry. 
but he'd steered for the mine next door, not for the step. So they got off with a beating. On May 9th, 1950, the fifth anniversary of victory in the Fatherland War, naval veteran Georgie Tenno entered a cell in the celebrated Kangir prison. It was a select company in the Kangir jail, brought together from various camps. In every cell there were experienced escapers, hand-picked champions. Tenno had found his committed escapers at last. They were destined never, never to remain long in one place. The committed escapers, like flying Dutchmen, were driven ever onward by their troubled destiny. If they didn't run away, they were transferred. This whole band of men in a hurry was switched, in handcuffs, to Ekebusta's camp jail. In something like a month there had been three attempts to escape from Ekebusta's, and still Tenno was not on the run. He was pining away, a jealous longing to outdo them gnawed at him. From the sidelines, you see all the mistakes more clearly and always think that you could do better. Janak was small, swarthy, very agile. When he caught fire, he was very energetic. He put everything he had into his work, into an impulse, a fight, or an escape. Of course, he lacked discipline, but Tenno had plenty of that. Everything pointed to the lime kilns as the best place for their escape. One day at the lime kilns, they damaged the electric cable of a cement mixer. An electrician was called in from outside. When Tenno helped him with his repairs, Zanak stole some wire cutters from his pocket. While they were at the lime kilns, the would-be escapers made themselves two knives. They chiseled strips of metal from shovels, sharpened them at their blacksmith's shop, tempered them, and cast tin handles for them in clay molds. Tenno's was a Turkish knife. It would be a handy weapon to use, and what was more important, the flashing curve of the blade was terrifying. Their intention was to frighten people, not kill them. Wire cutters and knives they carried to the living area held to their ankles by the legs of their underpants, and stowed them away in the foundations of the hut. Their escape plan hinged on the culture and education section. While the weapons were being made and transferred, Tenno chose a suitable moment to announce that he and Zanak would like to take part in a camp concert. Sure enough, Tenno and Zanak were given permission to leave the punishment wing after it was locked for the night, and while the camp area as a whole was still alive and in motion for another two hours. They roamed the still unknown camp, noting how and when the guard was changed on the watchtowers, and which were the most convenient spots to crawl under the boundary fence. In the culture and education section itself, Tenno carefully read the Pavlodur Provincial Newspaper, trying to memorize the names of districts, state farms, collective farms, farm chairmen, party secretaries, shock workers of all kinds. Next, he announced that he would put on a sketch, for which he must get a hold of his ordinary clothes from the clothing store and borrow a briefcase. A runaway with a briefcase, that was something out of the ordinary. It would help him look important permission was given. The sketch required so much rehearsing that the time left till lights out in the main camp area was too short, so there was one night, and later on another, when Tenno and Zanak did not return to the punishment wing at all, but spent the night in the hut which housed the culture and education section to accustom their own warders to their absence. Escapers must have at least one night's head start. What would be the most propitious moment to escape? evening roll call. When the lines formed outside the huts, the warders were all busy checking in prisoners, while the prisoners had eyes only for the doors, longing to get to their beds. No one was watching the rest of the camp area. The days were getting shorter, and they must hit on one when the roll call would come after sundown, in the twilight, but before the dogs were stationed around the boundary fence. They must not let slip those five or ten uniquely precious minutes because there would be no crawling out once the dogs were there. They chose Sunday, September 17th. It would help that Sunday was a non-working day, so that they could recruit their strength by evening, and take time over the final preparations. The last night before escape. You can't expect much sleep. You think and think. Shall I be alive this time tomorrow? Possibly not. And if I stay here in camp? To die the lingering death of a goner by a cesspit? No, you mustn't even begin to accept the idea that you are a prisoner. 
The question is this. Are you prepared to die? You are? Then you are also prepared to escape. A sunny Sunday. To rehearse their sketch, both of them were let out of the punishment wing for the whole day. The runaways were very short of food. In the punishment wing, they were short on rations, and hoarding bread would excite suspicion. They banked on seizing a lorry in the settlement and traveling quickly. However, that Sunday there was also a parcel from home, his mother's blessing on his escape. Glucose tablets, macaroni oatmeal, these they could carry in the briefcase. They must also get a hold of a katayusha, an improvised lighter consisting of a wick in a tube and a steel and flint to light it. This was better than matches for a man on the run. Sunday was coming to an end. A golden sun was setting. Tenno, tall and leisurely, and Janak, small and vivacious, now draped padded jackets around their shoulders, took the briefcase. By now, everyone in the camp was used to their eccentric appearance, and went to the prearranged departure point. On the grass between some huts, not far from the boundary fence and directly opposite a watchtower. The huts screened them from two other watchtowers. There was only this one sentry facing them. They opened out their padded jackets, lay down on them, and played chess so that the sentry would get used to them. The sky turned gray. There was the signal for roll call. The prisoners flocked to their huts. In the half-light, the sentry on his watchtower should not be able to make out that two men were still lying on the grass. His watch was nearly over, and he was less alert than he had been. A stale sentry always makes escape easier. They intended to cut the wire, not in the open, but directly under the tower. The sentry certainly spent more time watching the boundary fence farther away than the ground under his feet. Their heads were down near the grass, and besides, it was dusk so they could not see the spot at which they would shortly crawl under. But it had been thoroughly inspected in advance. Immediately beyond the boundary fence, a hole had been dug for a post, and it would be possible to hide there a minute. A little farther on, there were mounds of slag, and a road running from the guard's hamlet to the settlement. The plan was to take a lorry as soon as they reached the settlement. Stop one and say to the driver, Do you want to earn something? We have to bring two cases of vodka up from old Akabistas. What driver would refuse drink? They would bargain with him. Half a liter, all right? A liter? Right. Step on it, but not a word to anybody. Then on the highway, sitting with the driver in his cab, they would overpower him, drive him out to the step, and leave him there tied up. While they tore off to reach the Urtish in a single night, abandon the lorry, cross the river in a little boat, and move on toward Omsk. It got a little darker still. Up the towers, searchlights were switched on. Their beams lit up the boundary fence. But the runaways, for the time being, were in a shadowy patch. The very time. Soon the watch would be changed and the dogs would be brought along and posted for the night. Now the lights were switched on in the huts, and they could see the prisoners going in after a roll call. Was it nice inside? It would be warm, comfortable. Whereas here you could be riddled with tommy gun bullets and it would be all the more humiliating because you were lying stretched on the ground. Just so long as they didn't cough or sneeze under the tower. Guard away, you guard dogs. Your job is to keep us here. Ours is to run away. End of Part 5, Chapter 6